Alright guys, so here we're looking at uh, what happens as, Ref as Russia Revolution comes together here. So I'm going to use this uh, little PowerPoint. I got it from a guy named Scott Masters out at uh, Crestwood College. I add a few pieces of my own as well to it. Um, thank you, Scott. Uh, and uh, really, the Russia Revolution, how do we go from Russia, okay, to Soviet Union? And that's where this whole thing happens with the revolution. We'll talk about a few more parts of this in class as well, uh, but we're going to hit the big topics here. Uh, for your online notes in preparation for Wednesday, see how all this thing goes down. So, previously, Russian Russia has some, uh, you know, interesting things going on in it. Um, we have some issues here with, uh, you know, it's honestly the only autocracy left in Europe. So, you know, most other countries have gone to some type of of um, representational type government. So France kind of has the autocracy gone. Uh, you know, Germany has the Reichstag on with uh, Bismarck. Britain has this parliament. This is the only one yet that still has, you know, a king or the well, czar in this case and nobody else. So um, there's no representational thing, anything whatsoever here pre-1904, okay? Um, and so Nicholas II becomes czar after the assassination of his brother. Uh, and he's you know definitely a big guy about absolute rule, uh, and it's all you know the idea of, of uh, divine right, all those kind of things that kind of come into uh, king king kingliness, I'm gonna call it. Uh, and that's a big part of his belief, and it's, it's very very old school, very very you know 17th century, uh, but it's the way it is in in uh, Russia. Um, Russia does get involved with Japan, fighting over Swallow Islands in the Pacific in 1904. They lose badly uh, to a war where the peace treaty is helped, uh, decided by uh, Ted Roosevelt, actually. And so I'm going to slide myself around here a little bit today. Okay. Um, things start getting worse and worse and worse in terms of, of, of Russia, okay? Um, and so certain people start becoming, I'm going to call them rabble rousers, if you will, uh, in Russia. So um, the Social Democrat Workers' Party, uh, George Plankinov is a big person here. Um, they, you know, want to modernize Russia, have a more co modern kind of place, um, you know, capitalist, industrial kind of stuff. And the czar is actually all for that because, you know, um, you know, they were still a very air culture type place. And as we'll see in class, we're still very based on air culture and nothing else. You know, Russia had lost in Crimea, lost in the Russo Japanese War. They're behind. They're, you know, they're the old guy in Europe who's refusing to change. It's like you stop with a flip phone, flip phone instead of a, uh, of a smartphone kind of deal, or no phone for that matter. Um, and so a lot of people, you know, really had to work that way. And, and so revolution really became possible because conditions got so bad uh, as time goes on here. And as Vladimir Ilyanovich Lenin and the rest of the Bolsheviks kind of lead forward here, a lot of people have reason to join in with them. Um, here's some examples of the different uh, workers' parties that get together, the pictures there. Uh, revolution 1905 plays a big role here, too. And uh, we'll go in a little more detail in this class. We have time for it. Um, but there was a really... <laughs> what happened just kind of working class. I mean, people are angry, okay, especially the inner the city workers. I mean, by 1905, the only, the only really two industrialized areas in Russia, um, Moscow and St. Petersburg, so about it. Um, and, you know, the rest of the countryside is just, you know, peasants and nothing else. There's no ownership of land. There's famine. Uh, people don't have any money. It's just terrible. You can just see how bad conditions are it's going through here. And this is a really telling photo. Uh, you can see people literally starving to death. Uh, in in the streets and stuff, and um, the czar answers with very conservative type policies. Uh, whereas the czar, you know, maybe good ideas and kind of stuff. Um, the Duma, which is a, which was a, as this whole um, revolution takes place. I mean, there's strikes of workers, there's strikes of in mines and in factories. There's mutinies of the military. Um, uh, one of the most famous mutinies is the battleship Potemkin, where entire battleship mutinies over how terrible uh, the food is. Uh, there's a lot of issues here, and, and uh, conservatives is a way that the government cracks down this. So what they do is they send in troops. Uh, troops are shot, people are shot, and kind of, that kind of stuff in, in Moscow and in St. Petersburg. Uh, people are trying to get the attention and stuff. And that's how the, the, the czar, you know, uses this conservative policy against his people. Uh, you know, and so the Duma is created out of so out, out, out of the uh, Revolution 1905, the Duma is the, um, you know, it's basically representative body, but it's not really representative body. Does that make sense? It was there. I mean, it, it was it was it was there, and it was representative name only. Um, the only person that really had power was the Tsar, right? And the thing is, as 
time went on here, Nicholas became a lot weaker. He had more family issues he was concerned about. And he kind of becomes this, this absent ruler and just kind of gone. You know what I mean? And so you start having Soviets or little people's governments uh, appear all over the place. And Soviets were the group of people that kind of ruled um, themselves uh, as, as rulers of a city or a town or a state where it might be. Now, honestly, people argue that Alexandra here, the Tsarina, uh, was actually the you know power behind uh, behind him. I mean, she was very, very committed to autocracy. She was expected to have that kind of stuff. And top off, she was hanging out with this dude named Rasputin, uh, kind of this weird looking uh, scuzzy guy. I mean, he was a monk or a holy man, if you will, from out uh, in Siberia. Uh, he was known to come up with you know food in his beard and look all nasty and scraggly. Um, a lot of scandals involving, you know, his relationship with various women, young girls, etc., that kind of stuff. Uh, but he was supposedly had a magical power, right? Uh, a lot of scandals involving Rasputin and how much power he had with the Tsarina. Uh, rumors they were, you know, hooking up as well, but that's a whole other story. Um, but the thing that she was really worried about was her son. Her son here was Alexis. Here he is. Okay. Aw, cute little dude. But he had hemophilia. Hemophilia is passed down throughout the... Um, the Romanov line, and uh, one of the stories that basically is that Rasputin, she thought, could cure his hemophilia. With hemophilia, your blood does not clot. The big fear is that any injury to, you know, him, and, you know, the line is done, and, you know, he could bleed out. Uh, the story happens that he was riding a horse, I believe, a horseback ride, and he fell, and all of a sudden he is, you know, bleeding internally, uh, and she calls up Rasputin, and Rasputin is like, yeah, whatever, you know, he'll be fine, don't worry about it, and he lives, and she took this as a sign that Rasputin was a guy who could help her son and make him healthy again, and so he had a lot of power now within uh, the Romanov family. Well, World War I comes along and throws a big monkey wrench at everything. Obviously, we have the Nikki and Willie letters, we know these guys are trying not to have a war take place, um, but, you know, the war just kind of came up and showed just how messed up Russia was, okay? Um, there was such a disconnect between the ruling class and the peasants. It, they were miles apart in terms of where they should be. And so the leadership was very, very corrupt. All the officers were rich nobility who had no idea what they were doing. They literally only have their job because, you know, they're rich and they're nobles, and that's about it. Uh, the ordinary R Russian peasant was drafted, thrown to a war, not given any training, and they honestly could have given a fat rat's behind about who won World War I. Um, they didn't care, right? They were just being thrown to this, this whole deal. Um, and in some ways, the war is going to be the very last straw of, of the whole thing. I mean, the army was not trained at all. They were not equipped. They were not enough guns or, or ammo to go around. They weren't ready for a war. I mean, they didn't have enough industrialization. They didn't have enough modernization of their military. I mean, it was just crazy, you know what I mean? Uh, in the first year of the war alone, they have two million casualties, and people are deserting by the thousand, right? And so obviously, as this army is all in chaos, you know, the only thing they really have to their name is people. And so they're just trying to throw wave after wave after wave of soldiers at the Germans and let them get mowed down by German machine guns. Um, the German general on the Eastern Front is a guy by the name of Paul von Hindenburg, um, who later, later becomes president of Germany, of Germany, actually writing off his World War One fame. Um, but, you know, they lose so many battles. And this is being felt at home because obviously husbands and sons and brothers are going off to war, either coming back missing pieces or not coming back at all. And so the Russian people who have already been doing all this inequality, all sorts of stuff going on, poverty, etc., they're like, okay, now, besides all that's going on now, and the famine and whatnot, right? Now we're being thrown to a war and being used as machine gun fodder for German machine guns. What the heck? You know what I mean? And that's where we come down to where the, start, the, the, the government starts collapsing. Well, Tsar Nicholas, in his own mind, thought that he would fix the war effort by going to the front and rallying the troops. They didn't get two craps, all right? Uh, he actually brings his son, his son Alexis with them, and he wears a cute little military uniform, all that kind of stuff. Whatever, okay? Basically, then, you have uh, Alexandra <laughs> and Rasputin back running the show at home. Do we see a problem here? Yes. Um... All the government officials don't get along with her. She's trying to boss everybody around. The government, government officials are trying to boss her around. And, um, you know, people are being accused of treason because the war is going so terribly. Something has to go wrong here. Well, number one person to blame is Rasputin because, you know, he is kind of crazy. Um, and so he actually ends up eventually getting assassinated. Or, 
move my picture on you real quick here. Sorry about this, guys. Uh, he has eventually actually getting assassinated, um, and it's kind of a fun story how he's assassinated. Uh, he, you know, the the people who um, didn't like him, uh, they actually, you know, shot, stabbed, uh, castrated, and him, and then threw him off a river, off a bridge, up by after being poisoned as well. Um, and uh, <laughs> they think he died of drowning after he'd been shot, stabbed, castrated, and poisoned. Um, and they thought it would fix everything. It still doesn't. Things are not going very good yet. Um, the economy is totally being mismanaged. Obviously, other countries, we saw kind of that, that state-run economy, but you know, other countries are a lot more industrialized than Russia was. And so what they did have went through the, down the tubes. You have starvation and inflation being rampant, refugees coming in from the, from the famine areas. Um, and now the cities really became this hotbed of political activism as people moved from the country into the city where food shortages were, there's even less food. Uh, St. Petersburg later on as Petrograd is even worse in the situation uh, going on. So now we start having revolutions, right? 1917 rolls around, kings away at the front, people are still uproars. We have two revolutions in Russia, right? There's the March Revolution and the November Revolution. So the March Revolution is all kind of about the food problem, right? The Duma, who were, who were the... Um, Representative government, okay? They're like, listen, on March 12th, the czar is done, okay? We are now the ruling power of, of, of Russia. We will take care of the problems and fix things. The czar is like, uh, no, you didn't, uh, and says, soldiers, go fix the problem for me. Shoot them. The soldiers say, screw you, czar, and they abdicate and they uh, join the rebellion. So now, the one thing that the czar had over the people was the military. He has now lost that. And so now he has to give up. He has to abdicate, get out of there. Um, he still stays in Russia. essentially as a prisoner of the whole deal. But now we have um, a group called the Mensheviks. We'll talk about these more in class. Uh, Alexander Kerensky, who's now going to head this provisional government. And it's very popular. Um, Kerensky wants to see this very, very gradual social reform, fix the war effort, take care of that problem first, uh, and then move on from there. And that was the big goal they had for this whole thing, was to have this very gradual revolution. Well, things get worse, okay? Um, General Kornilov is the other issue here, okay? He tried to overthrow the government with a military take over, have the military be in charge. Um, what that Kornetsky did was he took a lot of the old Bolshevik, the communist leaders, who had been in prison, Okay, and who have been exiled out of the country and brought them back to fight against Kornilov. And that way you could fight against the military takeover. And so the Mensheviks who were kind of in charge are actually ended up feeding the Bolsheviks by bringing them back. And they let them out of prison, gave them arms, arms, armament, all kind of stuff to take down the military. Well, the Petrograd Soviet is going to be the biggest thing. I mean, these are probably be the most uh, left of the group. And so this was the Soviet, the local government uh, by the people of St. Petersburg, right? And they say, we're the legit government, all that kind of stuff. Um, Germany is watching this, sitting back and just watching this dumpster fire. It's like, huh, all right. Don't go worry about that anymore. And they start beating down more on France and Britain on the Western Front. Now, this is awesome. Vladimir Ivanovich Lenin, who had, Lenin, who had been that big rabble rouser who was eventually actually kicked out of the country by, um, you know, by, uh, uh, Bizarre stuff. Got him. He was banished from the country for Siberia, then out of the country at all. He's hanging out in Germany. Jimmy goes, Hey, Lenin, they're letting all the Bolsheviks back in. You should go back. And he got, ended up getting granted a safe passage back to Russia in 1917. So, you know, the stars kind of aligned to where it's, kind of where it's things going here. Now, the Soviet was much, much more revolutionary than and, ra and radical than the uh, provisional government. I mean, they were very, very influenced by Marxism. Um, Western socialists want to see an equal, uh, you know, everybody. And the, and the ideas of Marxism really, really appeal to them because they've been the ones who have been tried down for so long. They're the ones who are dying in the fields, in the streets, in the factories. And they really wanted to have that idea of equality and stuff. And in a, in a society that is, that, that is this unequal, throughout history, it's no wonder why, you know, they wanted to have, that they were, you know, definitely inspired by this Marxist ideology. So that means you have these two sides, right? You have the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks, the Mensheviks being kind of this more gradual social reform, led by Kerensky, you have the Bolsheviks led by Lenin, and Trotsky, those other guys who are more of a, um, you know, more of the Soviet, uh, you know, very revolutionary, radical type government looking for more of a Marxist type takeover. Um, and here's Lenin, who obviously had t spent time in Siberia, uh, kicked out, moved to London, um, and he had hung with his buddy named Trotsky, 
And uh, he said there's a vanguard that is required to the revolution, right? And so he wants to have his revolution take place in Russia. You need a certain people to kind of take charge, okay? And um, it really splits this whole thing in two. And as Lenin steps into this power vacuum that's there, as these two groups are fighting, uh, you know, they start granting, you know, all political prisoners have amnesty. Lenin shows up, and he is this very, very charismatic dude. I mean, he can talk anybody and almost anything. And um, the biggest thing he said were two big phrases. Number one was peace, land, and bread, which what all the peasants wanted, right? Think about it. They want to get rid of the war. Done. Peace. We're going we're, we're to give you peace. We want land because we don't own our own land. We're starving to death, all that kind of stuff. Land, you get it. And lastly, bread. We have a famine. We're starving. We're dying. Bread. And then lastly, we have power. Our power to the Soviets. So, boom, right away, he appeals to those masses of people and what they want to do. He also preached that the, um, the war was a whole capitalist imperialist type thing, and there was nothing for the workers to get out of it, and that when the Tsar left, he started the war, he's gone, war is done. And all of a sudden, people just love this thing. I mean, people, you know, jumped on this Bolshevik bandwagon and wanted to see them kind of take over. Um, and Lenin ends up, you know, making this military revolutionary council, uh, the Petrograd, you know, Soviet passes Army Order Number 1, which was a really important thing because it gave the army control uh, to the regular soldiers. So all of a sudden, now the generals have no control. The idea that there's no, you know, social ranking type thing going on. The army is in control of the top common soldiers. So Kornetsky, who was the general, opposing Lenin, obviously, as leader of this whole deal, is not undermined. He has no military control. The army is in craziness because, obviously, you have to have some kind of chain of command or pecking order, which you don't have anymore. That's gone. And it comes November. And here comes this big, huge ideological revolution that happens. Um, Leon Trotsky, the dude right down here with the awesome goatee um, and glasses, was the guy who kind of plans this whole thing. Um, he was a you know a guy who got the the got the uh, conference of the Red Army and kind of was the leader of this whole big Red Army uh, that develops. And um, you know the coup itself was led by Trotsky, who kind of got you know the army together. Um, they got rid of the assembly, which was you know basically the new Duma kind of thing. Um, there was you know not really lectures, kind of just kind of walked in and kind of took it over. And they said, "This is what we're going to do. All private property is gone. Done. Divide up on peasants." Boom. All, all large national enterprises were nationalized. Boom. Okay, controlled by the government. Controlled to the people. All things they're trying to promise people. Uh, to do that, they had a political police. Kind of a secret police called the Cheka, whose job was to take anybody out who opposed that idea. And they made the Red Army, which was, you know, kind of that big revolution army, which was going to make sure they kept everything in case. And so now we have the Communist Party as of 1918 uh, to go this whole deal. Now, uh, Lenin's first task was to rush out of the war, right? Because the war is when people are mad, you have to have that peace part, right? You just give them land, we'll find bread in a second, and we got to have the peace part. So the Treaty of brest litovsk um, Ludovsk, was the whole thing where Russia gave a lot of stuff to Germany, actually, in their peace treaty, um, and gave a lot of territory, resources, population, etc., just to get the war done over with and focus on what's going on at home. Now, the problem for Lenin is that now he has to fight his own civil war. He has a war between the whites and the reds. The, the reds are the Bolsheviks, the whites are the Mensheviks. And he had this whole complete breakdown of Russia and Russian society and everything. Um, there's a lot of weird things on here. Right? There's this in official interpretation of it um, that they want to try and have a permanent, like, industrial, uh, in, in international revolution, you know, workers of the world unite um, kind of thing. You also have a function of Russian history and culture of working for it by yourself, working for yourself, making sure everything's happening that way. Um, you know, you also have this other view of an imposed revolution on unwilling victim. Now the people want, want to have this revolution, right? And so you also have a social revolution of people trying to um, make things happen, try to, people that are trying to, um, you know, move up their social class to have social equality. Now, the Civil War is a hard part, guys, and uh, in the Civil War, we're looking at here in terms of what happens with it. You have Reds, Whites, Civil War, Lenin, Trotsky, it's the big terms you guys want to write down here. Um, you know, the, the opposition to the Bolsheviks are a bunch of different people. It's not just Mensheviks, there's a lot of different people that are there. Um, there are the White, right? So the uh, different groups that are there, you have um, a lot of assassination attempts on, on, on Lenin, you have the old, uh, the old, uh, um, Czarist type groups that are trying to take over power yet. A uh, lot of people actually run for uh, the upper class are very unhappy with the treaty uh, because um, of how much Russia gave up. Uh, starvation meant that you know even the national minorities are getting independent. So like um, you know starvation was really hard. I mean 
because people are mad they're starved. Lastly, national minorities. So you have the Cossacks and different groups that live in Russia are also trying to get their own independence and have their own opportunity to, you know, be equal. So a lot of things happen, right? So obviously you have all these different groups that are here. Um, you know, Reds want to stay in power, have this new society, whereas whites, all they want to do is different things, right? The only common thing they have is get the Soviets out of power. Kind of, you know, the enemy and my enemy is my friend kind of deal. But they're going to fight a lot between themselves. So it's not going to work out too hot. You know, with the Bolsheviks, where they held the large cities, large industry, and the railways, because where they control. Whereas these guys were all around out there and no communication happening. Leadership, you have Trotsky, who is this true leader of the rebellion. He's courageous, he's smart, he's educated. They have a special train they use to travel for different places to uh, run the whole war effort. And these guys got nothing, right? There was no, there was no one leader. Nobody trusts each other. They all fall, all fall against each other. It, it's just not good, right? Where do you look at this in class and that kind of stuff in terms of civil war and within class? But one thing is this whole civil war that happens um, is that outside forces actually invade, right, to try and help the whites. So here's the area that the Reds control right in the middle. Uh, British, French, American troops actually land up north here uh, by Murmansk and Archangel to try and take piss over. The Czechs get involved later on. Americans also come in on the west, try to make sure they help the whites out, but kind of do it on the secret, on the sly a little bit, and it doesn't work, okay? Now, as the war is going on here, I know this is the last little section we'll look at here real quick, and then the long notes we've done, I apologize. Um, you understand there were civil wars, right? The Bolsheviks won the war, but they had to do a lot of things that maybe didn't, went against what they originally talked about. Um, so one thing was called war communism, where essentially it, Lenin kind of walked in and said, listen, we got to do some things that communism is all about, right? Communism is all about sharing everything and no classes, right? Here's the deal. We need everyone to get on board real quick here. So, listen up. We're going to have the government take everything over for now, and then later on we'll gradually give stuff back, right? So all the factors take over the government. All production is planned by the government. Discipline, and that kind of stuff. You go against the government, you're shot. Um, peasant had to hand over all the extra food to the government to be given other places. Otherwise, they could be shot. Rationing system, where you only have the food you want to get. Free enterprise is illegal. All things were told by the state. Money is worthless. You're literally paid in food. So what they do is they basically have a full takeover, almost kind of like a state-run dictatorship, autocracy type thing going on. Um, but they call it war communism because we have to do this just for the length of the war, get through the war, and then we're good to go. All right? Um, <clears throat> you can see the consequences of the communism. People are starving. People are dirty. People are gross. Uh, people are dying. And that's one of the big problems, especially starvation amongst uh, poverty. Um I love some of these quotes. These quotes are crazy. This is where, you know, um, you know, it's the lady saying how, you know, they ate potato peel and nothing else. When they found a frozen crow, it was like the best thing in the world because now they had meat for that night. Um, how starving families would eat the dead sometimes. They'd eat a junior that died or they go find bodies in a cemetery and drag them back for their kids. Cannibalism happens, all that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> to top it off, then, uh, as people start getting all angry about this, you have what's called the Red Terror. This is where the Cheka, which is uh, the secret police of the Bolsheviks, um, react to an assassination attempt on Lenin. And it leads to mass executions among the middle upper class, especially because they were seen as being very disloyal. Uh, we're talking about 75,000 people murdered by the Cheka within the uh, first three years of civil war. And that is going to include eventually the Tsar and his family. They were originally in exile because um, obviously they're still the symbol of the old way of doing things. Uh, especially if they fell into the hands of the Mensheviks, the whites, they would be, you know, people who would, um, you know, be able to, you know, rally support among that kind of way things were before, and especially, you know, the Tsar and the, um, and, uh, you know, his, his heir, that kind of stuff. So this is where the movie Anastasia comes in. If you ever watched that one, there was no talking back, though, I promise, uh, where they're trying to get family members, the, the Tsar family members out of, out of Russia, all that kind of stuff. Um, eventually, the whole family was taken down to the cellar of the palace they were staying in. They were shot, buried out in the forest, and their bodies were not found probably until 1991. So their bodies were missing, missing for almost uh, 80 years. Um, they're hidden. So the idea, even the idea that the fear that their bodies could be used as a rallying tool against the Bolsheviks was thought of in this whole deal. The other thing is called the new economic policy, and Lenin figures out, crap, this is bad. We have to have incentives to make more food. So he actually went against his own policy and brought back parts of capitalism. Yes, Lenin brought back aspects of capitalism to make things work for the moment called the New Economic Policy. And it was honestly humiliating for those that were super communist supporters because they're like, crap, this is exactly what we want to do, isn't it? Um, 
so basically what they did is they ended requisition the requisition process of grain. So if you made more than you needed to eat, the government couldn't take any more from you. That's what basically it said. To top it off, if you did grow extra stuff, you could sell it for a profit and just pay taxes on it. That way you have some incentive now to grow food before if everything you grew was just taken right away, you have zero incentive. So why do it? You know what I mean? Um, you know, most of the big industry stayed in, sh in, in state hands, but if you wanted to work a small shop, small operation, or farm, you're allowed to do uh, this kind of stuff instead. And that's pretty successful since, you know, a lot of peasants, they could get some profit. Things working really, really well. Um, things are getting better. really helps stabilize the peace and give people some reason. I mean, you know, people make sure that, you know, these MEP men who start making some money off this was good. It was great. Um, but it helps start stabilizing things. The Russia was, okay, getting better on a, on a better view. And that is until May 1922. Uh, Lenin suffers a stroke, which he has two more after that. Pretty stressful job, right? And eventually dies. His body is placed on display um, in 1924. And now you have two people, uh, Leon Trotsky and Joseph Stalin, who are going to fight for who's going who's to run the show. And that's what takes us to the next, uh, next step of the uh, Soviet Union and what's going to happen between the wars. So thanks for listening, guys. I'm sorry it's kind of long. I apologize. You guys are awesome. Thank you very much.